Welcome back to SRC. SRC. Today we'll be reading the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. And we'll be making sport ball perler beads, so stay tuned. So this week for the four to five craft, we're doing a, a perler bead craft, and we're just going to be doing some sport balls. So let's jump into it. So for this craft, you're going to need some perler beads. We got ours at Michael's for around 10 bucks, and it came with the board and it came with the parchment paper that you need. You also are gonna need an iron. So to start, you're gonna just wanna figure out which design you're gonna wanna do. We chose a soccer ball, and then we started getting out the colors that we needed for it. Once you've figured out what you'd like to do, arrange your beads onto the pegboard. Adjust as you go to make sure you get the shape that you'd like. So once you've got your beads how you'd like, place a piece of parchment paper over the beads and then use an iron, be very careful and get help from an adult and use on medium heat and just go over the perler beads in a circular motion. Make sure you don't stay in one spot for too long and make sure you don't go for too long either. Keep lifting the iron up to check the beads underneath and see if they're done. Once they look a little bit melted together, they're probably ready. Leave it to cool for a minute and once it's cool, you can just peel it off the board. And there you go. Now if you wanted, you could add a magnet to the back or tie some string to it um, to make it into a decoration. Okay, so our perler beads are done now. Have fun making creations, guys. Hey guys, today we're going to be reading the first chapter of the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, written by C.S. Lewis and published by Scholastic Inc. So we're going to be reading chapter one today called Lucy Looks Into a Wardrobe. Once there were four children, whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. They were sent to the house of an old professor who lived in the heart of the country, 10 miles from the nearest railway station and two miles from the nearest post office. He had no wife and he lived in a very large house with a housekeeper called Mrs. McCreary and three servants. Their names were Ivy, Margaret, and Betty, but they do not come into the story much. He himself was a very old man with shaggy white hair which grew over most of his face, as well as on his head. And they liked him almost at once, but on the first evening when he came out to meet them at the front door, he was so odd looking that Lucy, who was the youngest, was a little afraid of him. And Edmund, who was the next youngest, wanted to laugh and had to keep pretending he was blowing his nose to hide it. As soon as they had said good night to the professor and gone upstairs to the on the first night, the boys came into the girls' room and they talked it all over. We've fallen on our feet and no mistake, said Peter. This is going to be perfectly splendid. What an old chap will let us do anything we like. I think he's an old dear, said Susan. Oh, come off it, said Edmund, who was tired and 
tending not to be tired, which what always made him bad-tempered. Don't go on talking like that. Like what? said Susan. And anyway, it's time you were in bed. Trying to talk like mother, said Edmund. And who are you to say when I'm going to bed? Go to bed yourself. Hadn't we all better go to bed, said Lucy? There's sure to be a row if we were heard talking here. No, there won't, said Peter. I tell you, this sort of house, there's no one... No one's going to mind what we do. Anyways, they won't hear us. It's about a 10-minute walk from here down to that dining room and any amount of stairs and passages in between. What's that noise, said Lucy suddenly. It was a far larger house than she'd ever been in before, and the thought of all those long passages and rows of doors leading to empty rooms was beginning to make her feel a little creepy. It's only a bird, silly, said Edmund. It's an owl, said Peter. This is going to be a wonderful place for birds. I shall go to bed now, I say. Let's go and explore tomorrow. You might find anything in this place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along? And the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There might be hawks. Badgers, said Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. But when the next morning came, there was a steady rain falling, so thick that when you looked out the window, you could see neither mountains, nor the woods, nor the stream in the garden. Of course it would be raining, said Edmund. They had just finished their breakfast with the professor and were upstairs in the room he had set up part for them. A long, low room with two windows looking out in one direction and two in another. Do stop grumbling, Ed, said Susan. Ten to one, it'll clear up in an hour or so. And in the, in the meantime, we're pretty well off. There's a wireless and lots of books. Not for me, said Peter. I'm going to explore the house. Everyone agreed to this, and that was how the adventure began. It was the sort of house that you never seemed to come to the end of, and it was full of unexpected places. The first few doors they tried led only to spare rooms, as everyone was expected that they would. But as soon as they came to a very long room full of pictures, there they found a suit of armor. And after that was a room all hung with green with a harp in one corner. Then came three steps down and five steps up. Then a little kind of upstairs hall and a door that led out onto a balcony. And then a whole series of rooms that led into each other and were lined with books. Most of them were very old books and some bigger than the Bible in the church. And shortly after that, they looked into a room that was quite empty, except for one big wardrobe, the sort that has a looking glass in the door. There was nothing else in the room at all except dead blue bottle in the windowsill. Nothing there, said Peter, and they all chopped out again, all except Lucy. She stayed behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying, worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe even though she felt almost sure that it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily, and two mothballs dropped out. Looking into the inside, she saw several coats hanging up, mostly long fur, co fur coats. There was nothing Lucy liked so much as the smell and feel of fur. She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them leaving the door open, of course, because she knew that it would be very foolish to shut oneself into a wardrobe. Soon she went further and found that there was a second row of coats hanging up behind the first one. It was almost quite dark in there, and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her as to not bump her face into the back of the wardrobe. She took a step further, then two, then three, always expecting to feel the woodwork against the tip of her fingers, but she could not feel it. And oh, too many pages. There must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going further in and pushing the soft folds of the coat aside to make room for her. Then she noticed that there was something crunching under her feet. I wonder if it's more mothball, she thought, stooping down to find it with her hand, but instead feeling a hard, smooth wood on the floor of the wardrobe. She felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. This is very queer, she said. 
and went on a step or two further. Next moment, she found that there was rubbing against her face and hands, which was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough, may and even be prickly. Why is it just like branches of trees? exclaimed Lucy. And she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of the wood at nighttime, with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling in the, hair, in the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inqui inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder, and there, between the dark tree trunks, she could see the opening of a doorway of the wardrobe and even catch a glimpse of the empty room in which she had set out. She had, of course, left the door open, for she knew that it was a very silly thing to do to shut oneself into a wardrobe. It seemed to be daylight there. I can always get back if anything goes wrong, thought Lucy. She began to walk towards, crunch, crunch, over the snow and through the wood, toward the other light. In about ten minutes, she reached it and found it was a lamppost. She stood looking at it, wondering if there, why there was a lamppost in the middle of a wood and wondering what to do next. She heard a pitter-patter of feet coming toward her. And soon after, a very strange person stepped out from among the trees into the light of the lamppost. He was only a little taller than Lucy herself. And he carried over his head an umbrella, white with snow. From the waist upward, he was like a man, but his legs were shaped like a goat's. The hair on them was a glossy black, and instead of feet, he had goat's hoofs. He also had a tail, but Lucy did not notice this at first because it was neatly caught up over the arm that held the umbrella so as to keep it from trailing in the snow. He had a red woolen muffler around his neck and his skin was rather reddish too. He had a strange but pleasant little face with a short pointed beard and curly hair and out of the hair there stuck two horns on each side of his forehead. One of his hands, as I have said, held the umbrella. In the other arm, he carried several brown paper parcels. Within the parcels and the snow, it looked just as if he had been doing his Christmas shopping. He was a fawn, and when he saw Lucy, he gave such a start of surprise that he dropped all of his parcels. Goodness gracious me, he explained the fawn. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. If you're interested in reading the rest of Narnia, it's in our collection. You can always come pick it up. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.